What we're thinking about this morning is the work of God in begetting through the gospel. I want to, first of all, I want to sort of tell you where I'm going with this and then we'll recount this at the end and see if we've gotten there. The, in other words, the purpose of this is not just to relay information. Many of the verses that I'll be reading you all are familiar with, but I want, I want us to think of them as I've prepared. I've thought of many of them in a different way. What we're looking at here is the source of our salvation, God's intention in your salvation. Through the prophets, he made it known that he rose early to get the message out. And this is actually what the gospel does. The gospel was working before you realized it on your behalf. In other words, it's God's intent that men be saved. So as we speak and, and listen and consider these things, I want us to more fully appreciate the proactive nature of our God to redeem man. This is his idea, this is his work. This is actually, if you wanna look at it this large, this is actually the purpose for the world, that he would be known as one that redeems men. And also to encourage us because we are participants in this salvation. The text that Sister Allie read a few minutes ago had to do with Paul as a minister of the gospel. And so he was speaking to the Corinthians there and he was saying, I was instrumental, but the focus is not on Paul. The focus is on the gospel. The focus is upon God's work. But yet God employs us to do that. And so I want us to be encouraged that we are these participants by God's design. So we're co-laborers together with him. The word still stands that Jesus spoke. He, he said, you must be born again. You must be born again. There is no other way. Remember, this was in an opening response and answer to Nicodemus' inquiries when he came to him there at night. But it rang out the indispensable necessity of entering into a life beyond the here and now, beyond that of the natural order. So Jesus said, truly, truly, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see or he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And he continued after that to speak to Nicodemus. And actually he was summing up, as we would say, the gospel to Nicodemus. Here's, there are several things that he told him. He said the source of this new birth that he was impressing upon him was from heaven. Nicodemus, of course, he was, how, how can this be? How can a man you know, be born again and so forth? But Jesus was talking about another source, from heaven. The new birth is from heaven, it's from God. He also, Jesus was implicating himself as the one that would be the accomplishing person of this activity. This is what his ministry was about. He was demonstrating that he as the son of man would be the savior of the world. Also, he was declaring that the participation of, of the recipients of salvation, in this case, Nicodemus, the ones that are entering in, the ones that are going to be born again, it's done by believing. He told this to Nicodemus. That's, that's pretty accurate representation right there of the gospel. It's, it's from God, it's for you, and Jesus accomplished it. But the several of the things that we see in the, in the text here, Brother Jeremy covered this matter of serving and laboring in the gospel as far, as far as Paul being the participant in this with the Corinthians. This is noted in several other cases. I just wanted to bring these in because this was not unique to the Corinthians. Remember in the book of Philemon, he talked about Onesimus whom I have begotten in my bonds. Writing to possibly Philemon himself, he said that you owe unto me even your own self besides. Also he spoke this about Timothy. He called him my own son in the faith. See, So there is a work that we have to do, but before we knew it and before we actually picked up the, or you know, took up the reins as it were, God was working on the behalf of the salvation of men, even, even in our ministry. So though Paul and all the other able ministers of the gospel are cru crucial because of God's working in the role, actually the focus here is on the power of the gospel itself. So we're going to look at that. In other words, we're highlighting God's activity through the gospel message. We're all familiar with the, the types and shadows of the scriptures. Types and shadows operate in, in several ways and like on several different levels. We think of persons like Moses. When we think of Moses, we think of the law. Or we think of, as Hebrews talks about him, a, a servant faithful in, his own, in all his house. We think of Melchizedek. We also think of, besides persons, we think of articles, all the things in the tabernacle. Or we think of the sacrifice of bulls and goats. These were actually things that were done, but they represent greater realities. Salvation is like this. 
here this morning, when we're speaking of being begotten by the gospel, we're actually speaking of not a thing or a person so much as a process, something that takes place over time. So processes are actually implemented by God. They're, they're workings of accomplishment. That's what begetting is. When you think of begetting, many of us are parents. All of us are children at some point. We think of uh, a source, a father, a mother. We think of something fruitage coming from that, children born. So this is what begetting is speaking of. It was actually begun in the natural creation. I'll give you verses that illustrate this. Remember how Jesus was the one that was spoken of as the, as the maker of the worlds, the creator of the worlds? But he did this with this aspect, the herb yielding seed, the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind. You see that language in there? Whose seed is in itself. That's the language of begetting. In other words, fruitage is to be born. In other words, this is not true as we know it among the angels or the heavenly beings. This is unique to earth. So this is unique in salvation that there be fruitage, that there be begetting, that there be something coming from something that was before. Be fruitful and multiply, he told Adam and Eve. Even to the animals, fill the waters, fill the earth, fill the air, the birds, the fish, all of these things. Man, though, was made in God's image. Adam was not himself born. He was formed of the dust of the earth, and then God breathed into him and gave him the breath of life. That was in a natural sense. But remember, even Adam his, himself, as traced in the genealogy in Luke chapter 3, it, says, it goes on through the different ones, and it says, Adam, who was the son of God. See, so there was a begetting even in a natural sense. So we're moving from what we see in the natural order to that which God is demonstrating in the spiritual or the order that will be enduring. Many of the records in the Old Covenant writings, for example, in the books of the Chronicles or in Ezra or Nehemiah, you see this language, he, his sons, and his brethren. So there's always a looking back to trace where something came from. That's what begetting is about. See, we're tracing God's work in the gospel, and it has to do with your salvation. Matthew's book of the generation of Jesus Christ begins... Abraham begat Isaac, Isaac begat Jacob, and so forth. And it traces this all the way through these many to Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. See, so there's a beginning. And again, he was not the son, naturally speaking, of Joseph, the husband of Mary. But you see how it's traced back to David, to Abraham, to ones that had the promises of God already given to them. So in, in this this morning, summing it up, I'm, I wanna say our intention is to explore and to understand the working of the gospel in the process of God saving men, bringing them from darkness, bringing them into his marvelous light. But the very first thing that God did was bring man to life by breathing into him. So salvation is essentially the bringing of life. And we know, naturally speaking, when someone is born, there's actually a work that has gone on before that. Is that right? Nine months, we reckon it, in the human uh, standard. But he formed man by framing, or forming him, rather, of the dust of the earth and breathing in his breath. But it foreshadows the greater creative act of bringing men to life by means of the gospel. Here's some parameters or some guidelines as we speak through this, just think along these lines. These are things that are common that help us in our understanding when we think of the natural act of begetting that speaks of God's work of begetting men unto salvation by the gospel. The unseen work takes place before the seen. There are things going on in your salvation before you saw them happening, before even others observed them, unseen before the seen. Secondly, there's a joining of co-laborers or workers together for fruit. God is working, Christ is, has worked and is working, the Spirit is definitely working in this matter. There are men, there are other brethren that are working toward your salvation, but all unto a common goal, that there be fruit unto God, men that are redeemed, men and women. Also, there's a close association to the work formed. There's not, there's not an input that's separate from the expected goal or end. See, what God puts into you in salvation is like himself. So the gospel is working things that are like God and like his nature. We're being made in, 
formed into the image of Christ and of God. See, we're coming unto that perfect man. And that has to do with the imputation of characteristics. The parent is the parent or parents are obvious in the children, even in how they look, how they speak, their mannerisms, even as they grow older. And so it is no surprise that we are taking on the characteristics of our Heavenly Father also. And not only is this something that I, I'm not going to speak at length, but this is actually a continuing process. The gospel continues to work this. It doesn't just, as it were, bring you to the birth. We're, men are not just born again and then, you know, God goes on to the next avenue of, of work here. He is continuing to work with us in Christ and through the gospel. And that's what many of you brethren have been speaking about already. Just, just for the sake of clarification, and these things overlap, let's distinguish between the words create, beget, and born or birth. Again, they're, they're all similar, they're all working in the same direction, but beginning, we're looking at primarily in like the early stages. That's what we're talking about this morning in this text. To create would be to fashion by intention without depending on something former. Like now there's nothing, now there is. That's creation. You see that in Eden, in the garden. God said, I will create all things new. See, so that, in a sense, bears over into the new creation too. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature or a new creation. So we're not depending upon things we were before, spiritually speaking. It is a new creation. And yet there are uniqueness to each of these words. Being born means to bring to life. It's like the, the final appearance of what's been forming for a period of time. It's the imputation of new life, but it's from existing life. In the natural order, parents beget children. So it's not that something just springs out in salvation suddenly is there. There was a work going on. It's God's work. And then beget, we're speaking particularly of the source of that being. So in the subject at hand this morning here, this focus is on the preparatory, the foundational, the structural, all these dealings of God, sometimes even hidden, sometimes before we had knowledge of them. But we're looking at this as the impact or the work of the gospel, the gospel as a message of truth. So the gospel is actually moving you into this new birth before you entered in yourself. In this, so in this process, begetting is actually preceding birth, but both are works of creation. In this way, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. See, it's all knit together, and yet there are, we're looking at this former aspect of it. The gospel, then, is the whole realm of activity in which the, the begetting will take place. The gospel is the power of God into salvation. Now, now how? Is it just like going to take you and twist you and force you into salvation? Well, no. The gospel is the power of God in this way. It's an inner motivation. You sense who you are. You sense your needs. See, the gospel works inwardly like this. The power of God is in the matter of persuading the heart. It's a matter of taking a heart that is dark and, and does not know and bringing it to an awareness of its need. This is how the power of God into salvation works by the gospel. The gospel has like a right to do this. It has a privilege to do this. See, this is how God has set this about to take place. The gospel even has a stewardship to bring these things to our attention. Amen. And this stewardship has actually been put in the hands of men. This is an encouragement to us because we know that the works of God, and yet it's been placed into our care and our possession, as it were. Remember how Paul talked about persuading men? See, that's what it is. This is, a, this is a careful work. Begetting is not a sloppy work. Begetting is not something that's done uh, either hastily or forcefully. Begetting is something that's very careful. It's, it's like an inner, cautious and careful preparatory work. Some of the other words that are, that are not necessarily uh, from this scripture, but we think of in relation to this, would this is this word to procreate. The word pro means like ready and and forward to do so, to initiate, to cause, to conceive, or even this word gestation, like there's an incubation period, something that's taking place, working in the right direction, to carry, talk about carrying a baby unto uh, the time of the birth, to develop, all these things are involved. As there is, naturally speaking, a gestational period between conception or begetting unto the birth, 
So the gospel has a sometime hidden but real and necessary work of preparation for the conversion of the human soul. The act of begetting actually informs us about God himself. It's his inclination to beget, to cause to come to the birth and to be born. It's his work to multiply, to bring forth. It's his work to be as the one that is, cause, he is, God is the causative factor in growth. If there's growth, God did it. The whole Project Earth really has this, this outcome of manifesting God's glory, but it's particularly related to offspring. When you, remember he said the, uh, the, the field is the world? Really, it's like a, it's, we've said it's a stage, but it's actually a field for fruit unto God. And this is accomplished in the gospel, bringing men unto salvation. From John 3, the wind bloweth where it listeth, you hear the sound of it, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Were we able to measure by some sort of a spiritual ultrasound? So in salvation, in the early stages, we could detect the faint but strengthening heartbeat of a soul longing for release from sin. We could discern the outline of fingers of faith reaching out to take hold of heavenly realities. We would see muscles and sinews of belief forming and flexing in a response to the good news of the gospel. We could make out eyes of understanding, beginning to view Christ Jesus as the Son of God. See, all these things have to take place coming to the birth. We could see the forming of ears that now hear, and they're gladdened by the report of a full atonement. The message of peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ begins to imprint upon a new heart, a heart of flesh, and development of a new sound mind. It's actually a spiritual mind. It's orienting the young for stability, for wisdom, for endurance. So the work of begetting, you see, it's intentional. It's forthright. It's of an increasing nature. That which is begotten of God it has dimension, it has shape, see, it has purpose, it has substance, it has capacity, it is being made into a life alike unto its source or its begetter, who is God. All of that begetting work is proportionate. It's healthy. See, in the human realm, there are times when things don't go as well as we would expect. But nutrients in the gospel are received and utilized in perfect accord. Growth is steady. This act of begetting is well on the way. Amen. I want to just read some scriptures here that give us a, like the scriptural language of begetting. Isaiah. Now this takes place uh, on, again, the scripture is not random, scattered here, there, and everywhere. It's all knit together. And so you see this uh, spoken of men. You see it spoken of nations, primarily Israel. You see it spoken even of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. So here's just some language to to uh, soak in for a moment. From Isaiah 49, listen, O isles, unto me, and hearken, ye people, from afar. The Lord hath called me from the womb. From the bowels of my mother hath he made mention of my name. And he hath made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand hath he hid me, and made me a polished shaft. In his quiver hath he hid me, and said unto me, Thou art my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. That's begetting. Jeremiah 1, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. In the book of Galatians, Paul spoke of himself. He said, but when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace. And it was noted of him in the book of Acts that he is a chosen vessel unto me. See how God was working ahead of time. Not, not just, we think of this in the natural sense many times, but God is working actually in a greater way and in a more former way unto our salvation than we had expected or even ever thought. From 1 John, there, there are several. In, if that which you have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye also, ye also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. And you see a lot of emphasis here on this matter of the seed. Just like in the garden the seed was in itself see that there's a seed 
that's planted in salvation. That's at like the conception stage. And it's going to bear fruit. And it's maybe not apparent at the beginning, but it's going to demonstrate where the seed came from. It's going to bear fruit unto God. So whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. For his seed, that's God's seed, remaineth in him. And he cannot sin because he is born of God. Amen. And every one that loveth him that begat, loveth him also that is begotten of him. He that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and the wicked one toucheth him not. Now these are these are true of all the thing all the ones that God begets. It is it's not to say that every one begotten of God is exactly the same because God works in and through and forms different personalities. So begotten personalities are unique, but each one unmistakably bears resemblance to his creator, to his origin, to his source, his redeemer. Several things I want to look at just as this we've gone this far and I sort of want to look in retrospect over what we've just said. I, Begetting requires and it testifies to several things. First of all, the source. Second, an intention and a will. Thirdly, a place and a time. And then also a continuing and directed work. So I want to address each of these. First of all, the source. Scriptures with these. First Peter 1 Peter 1.3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again. Now again, there is not, not saying... See, we're talking about the second birth here. We're talking about a birth that's of not the natural order. So he has begotten us unto a lively hope. How? By the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So in the gospel, this is linked to Christ himself. This is not separated from Jesus Christ. And I'll, I'll speak about that more in a moment. Also, this matter of the intention or will of God concerning his sons. John 1, verse 13 speaks of those that are born not of blood, not of the will of the flesh, not of the will of man, but of God. So therefore our sonship is derived from one, and that one is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Peter wrote about this in this way, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. And then later he added, this is the word by which the gospel is preached unto you. See, he knit, he knit those two concepts together that the gospel was employed in bringing the word to you. The, the word has to be heard, but God is active in every facet or every portion of this work. He gives us ears to hear. He gives us eyes to see. He's giving you these things. He's forming these things in you that enable you to receive the gospel initially, but also continually and ongoing. And then the place and the time. I like to think of uh, many of the Psalms were written in their day they have a ministry concerning the psalmist himself or maybe some experience of his life. Many of them are prophetic. Brother Al looked into a number of these ones speaking they you, you have to leave the ground and you have to soar up and see how he's speaking the psalmist is speaking by the Spirit of Christ but they also speak of this work of salvation. One of these is Psalm 110, the third verse. Just, just a small phrase. Speaking of begetting, thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. What's this? In the beauties of holiness, from the womb of the morning, thou hast the dew of thy youth. See, this is an early work, something that's formative. Here then is the input session. Here is where the faith and hearing begin their work. Remember. Faith comes, hearing comes, all these things come, but they come by the gospel. The gospel is like the delivery or the implementation of these things early on. Here is the initial perception of the nature of God, and it begins to dawn upon the spirit. Titus, Paul writing to Titus said, but after that the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, See, there, there's, a, there's a time factor to this. It has, it has to be recorded upon the, the simple conception stage, and then it has its work and grows. He says, after that, and then he says, it's not by works of righteousness which we have done. It's according to his mercy by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. It's like, it's like the DNA of the new man is being formed in this early like, like the amniotic sac, spiritually speaking, of the gospel. 
this DNA of who you are going to be in your salvation, God is forming. James wrote about the continuation and the, the direction of this work. He said, of his, God's own will, he beget us with the word of truth, so that we should be a kind or a type of first fruits of his creatures. We would, we would not expect a newborn to come to the birth and then, uh, you know, how they get them to breathe and get them to eat and they begin and then all of a sudden just cut that off. See, so this has to continue. Breathing and eating and intake through the gospel must continue, but it, be, but it definitely is begun and formulated by God at an early time. The gospel serves then as like a, a perpetual motion. It serves as an activator to continue to cause that which God has formed to grow. There's a continual immersion in the waters of the gospel and it enables steady, productive growth. The gospel will provide nourishment and strength for all or any involvements of your faith life. But even before you knew it was making that provision. Jesus himself identified with man in many ways, but he actually did identify in this involvement also. He entered the world by a begetting. Remember, it talks early on in Luke, the angel came and spoke not only to Mary, but also to Joseph, and he told him and her that that which would come would be begotten of the Holy Ghost. And yet later on, this was not the only begetting of Jesus, when the I believe it was the Apostle Peter looked back and he, no, it was Paul, when he drew in uh, Acts 13, when he drew upon this, the circumstance about beginning, he said, this day have I begotten thee. In other words, he's speaking of the resurrection, see? So again, the Jesus himself identified with this involvement of beginning, not only naturally speaking, but unto spiritual life. Not that he was dead, you understand what I mean. So. The promise was fulfilled that Jesus was raised up. This day have I begotten thee. In Colossians 1, it talks about him as Jesus, as the firstborn of every creature. Not firstborn in the sense that he was born, but in, his, in the uh, placement where he is. He's before all things and above all things. He is the creator of all things. And then it also speaks of him as the one that is the firstborn from the dead. So we see in this work, I want to read one more text to you. This is from Psalm 139. You've been no doubt comforted in the Lord knowing you in a, in a personal fashion in this, but I, it's something that when you read through, you want to think of this matter of beginning unto spiritual life. This is Psalm 139, beginning in verse 13. For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And we're not talking about, see, fingers and toes so much. That's true, but we're talking about how the things that God is forming in you unto your salvation. Marvelous are thy works, that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, and in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. So again, the purpose that we've gathered around, our thoughts around this morning is to more fully appreciate the nature of our God and the work that he has done to redeem men and to encourage us to participate in that. And then I wanted to add this as an exhortation. This is actually taking place, brethren, while we're sitting here. We have, we have a lot of younger members in this room, and the gospel is beginning to work. And we anticipate a time of baptism and a time of new birth and of confession in them. But see, this is what we're all about. We meet together. So continue in this good work. Thank you, brother. Now you all know I'm not one of the younger members in this room. But let me tell you, the gospel is still working in me.